Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Carrington School, the Board of Education workshop. We'll begin this evening uh, with a silent prayer. Uh, Commissioner Jason Van Stone, could you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? <laughs> Are you Mrs. Renner? We have Good evening, everyone. I'm Karen Renner, the principal of Carrington School. This is Kristen Gwizdowski, my vice principal. Thank you for being at our school tonight. We're happy to have you. Our pleasure. Yep. Um, this is going into my third year as principal of Carrington. And in that time, we have implemented some new procedures and practices that have really proved to be effective, and we're really proud of the progress that we see here at school and in all grades in the subject areas of ELA and math, and especially on our Smarter Balance Assessment tests. Just briefly, I have a few highlights for you in that area and in math. This is based on students that were meeting or exceeding the grade level. Um, we follow the cohorts from grades four to five in year 15, 16 to 16, 17. And in math, they made a 13.1% increase and the cohort in grade from five to six, again from year 15 to 16 and 16 to 17, made a 10.2% increase in math. And again, that was due to some um, different procedures and practices that we put in place. And a few highlights in ELA, the cohort, again, from students in grade four to grade five in year 15 to 16 and 16 to 17 made a 9.2% increase. And the students in grades, um, from six to grade seven in the same years was an 8.5% increase. So um, we're really proud of that. And um, we have just completed our beginning of the year testing. Oh, there goes our banner. <laughs> and M class nice and I ready. It is too. <laughs> and just take it down. All right. Oh. It's a beautiful banner. Go Cougars. <laughs> <laughs> but as I was saying, there, our beginning of the year testing um, in M class and I ready and math and ELA have really been promising, so we're off to a great start. Um, cool. But I just, you know, Kristen and I work so well together and I couldn't do it without her. But um, I just have to say that the teachers and the staff here are just so dedicated and committed to their professions. Every student is truly valued and we believe that every student could achieve at such high expectations and levels and i have some of my staff here tonight and and i just want to acknowledge them they're over here and they great so but we all really just share in the mission and mission and vision of carrington and I say it to them, and I probably don't say it enough or express it the right way, but I truly am grateful and blessed every day that I come here, and I work with such a great staff, and, I'm, and I consider them not only my colleagues, but my friends, too, so um, it really is a great place to work, and we truly are a Carrington family. Um, and just a bit on that, our, we have a math, our math coach isn't here tonight, or a uh, reading facilitator, but they're just invaluable in the sense of helping and supporting the teachers and working in our IDTs and seeing really what the teachers need to support them um, in those meetings in the classrooms and looking at data. And um, so they really are a, a, you know, a great asset to us in the building. Um, and it really is a collaborative effort every day that we make. And the last thing is I really believe that our students love being here. We had a 97% attendance rate last year. Mm -hmm and we received an award from that at our Students' Governance Council breakfast, and we really are proud of that, and I really believe that the students like to be here, they love to be with the teachers in the classroom, the teachers make it exciting and creative, and they really support the students and really um, help them to thrive, and 
and grow in their areas, areas that they need help with. So um, again, I'm just very humbled to be the principal here at Carrington. Um, just moving on. Um, our district has initiatives, as you know, and this year um, it was focused on social emotional learning. And um, we have a couple of projects that we're excited about that we started that focused on, you know, just changing our climate and culture a little bit and creating a stronger sense of community within our building and our school. Um, the first thing is um, the Rock Project. And um, I don't know if any of you came in by the way of that door, but if you have a chance to go out there and see it, um, it's illuminated at night. And it's, um, it was a project that was um, started from a book called Only One You, and it, was, um, it promotes uniqueness and developing an understanding of diversity. And all our students um, painted rocks, and um, we have them on display outside, and they're just representative of themselves. And they were very creative. There's a couple slides behind you. You can take a look. But um, we also had the staff um, make them as well. So you can just, you know, there's hearts, there's New York Yankees, and Boston alike, sadly. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, but they're really, they Take really were creative. And, yeah. But we had, um, they were better than we expected, and it is beautiful out there. And um, so if you have a chance to take a look at it, um, it really, it was a great project. Um, our other SEL initiative is um, our wingman project or program. And um, we do actually have the, the founder here, Ian Hockley, and he's just going to um, say a few words regarding um, the program. And um, we had the big kickoff on October 10th, and um, the mayor was here, and Mrs. Baim, our ILD, and um, it really was a great day. So I'm just going to let you um, hear him speak on it and how it came to be. Thanks, Karen, and thank you for having me here this evening. Um, evening. My name is Ian Hockley. Um, I moved to the States uh, in 2011 with my family, um, and my son Dylan was one of the children that was lost at San Diego Elementary on 12-14-12. We started a foundation, Dylan's Wings of Change, in his memory. And in 2014, we were very fortunate to meet uh, two athletics coaches who lived in Middlebury who always professed in their sports program about teaching children how to take care of each other and build a, a strong group where no one was left behind. So we started a program working with them under the principle of being someone's wingman. Uh, and that program was developed for sports clubs. In 2015, we were very fortunate to be introduced to Connecticut Association of Schools, to CAS, and they helped us uh, translate what was a, a program on the sports field into the classroom and develop it into a, a proper social emotional learning program. We started working with three schools at that time, most notably New Fairfield Middle School and City Hill Middle School, and they helped us develop not only the program curriculum, but also training the students as leaders. In 2016, we were fortunate to grow to seven schools, uh, one of which was Gil Martin here in Waterbury. Mm -hmm. as, as the program grew, we also uh, created a module for dance studios. So now we're, we're touching sports clubs, schools, and dance studios. 2017, the program continued to grow. We now have 18 schools enrolled in the program, and we're, we're very happy that uh, Reed, uh, Carrington, and Duggan have also joined the Wingman family there, and they've all Im implemented the program. Wingman is student-led and directed. We bring in trainers to work with a group of students and train them as facilitators, and they take the activities that form the core of the program into the classroom. So we're taking workload off the teachers, and we're also putting the student voice into the program. And as part of the training for the student leaders, they talk to the trainer about what it's like to be in their school, what the climate is like, and what they would like to work on. So the program doesn't come in with a pre prescribed curriculum of, of what, what needs to happen at that school, because schools are very different you know, from, from one school to another. So it's student-led with some very dedicated teachers, usually three or four teachers in each school are dedicated to supporting the students and, and rolling it out. Teacher leaders for the teaching. Yes, thank you. Um, there's no charge for the program. The foundation doesn't charge for the program. In fact, we try and help with some of the costs, which is notably the training the student leaders and some of the materials needed to get the program off the ground. And really, it's just about the principle of being a wingman. 
if you think in the Air Force, the wingman is the pilot that's looking out for the rest of the squadron and, and looking out for danger. And we're trying to instill those same qualities in the students themselves and bring out the very best in them and things they want to work on, such as courage and perseverance and being observant and taking care of each other. Um, we kicked off here in, in 2017. See some of the slides there. It was a very, very loud, very impactful presentation. We're just looking forward to maintaining that momentum and taking it forward. Um, we shared Dylan's story with the students. He was a little boy who couldn't communicate very well. He couldn't always follow instructions, and so he couldn't often get involved in activities. But if there was someone who would slow down and take the time to explain things to him and help him through things step by step, he could become involved and included. And really, that's, that's, that's the principle of being a wingman. And if Dylan needed it all of the time, then it's fair to say all of us at some point in the day or the year need someone to be there for us. And that's what we're trying to do for the children. It's not about take, just taking care of your friends. It's being there for anyone that's in trouble. Very grateful to be here working, working with Carrington and all the schools in Waterbury. And thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we look forward to every school having a wingman program. Are there any questions for our guest? Liz, yep. I'm sorry. Vice President. How Richard. are you? Thank you for the wonderful work you guys are doing, Karen. Thank you for the presentation earlier. But I did hear that you guys have some student leaders here. And I think if they are present, we should acknowledge them. Yes. Thank you. Great. Can you have them stand, please? Right. Um, and I just, if I may, indulge me for a second. Ivan Hernandez is here, my Carrington teacher, Marnie Ford, Eileen McDonald, Carl Brault. Nancy McCullough, Karen uh, Cavanaugh, Elvira Barbosa. That's um, my Carrington staff. Is there anybody else that I left out? I hope. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, and um, Jerry, our custodian, and Becky, who prepared this lovely food for you. So thank you <laughs> thank to you everybody. All. We also have um, our student, we have Pumas back there, and, and those are students that are selected in seventh and eighth grade that are, um, ex show exemplary characteristics. Um, and so, come on over here. <laughs> They're very humble, but they do a great job, and they're here, they come on nights when we have um, parent-teacher events, like, and they um, guide the teachers to the, um, the, I'm sorry, the parents to the classrooms. They say the pledge in the morning and our Carrington mission and vision in the morning for us on the, um, on the loudspeaker, and they help out whenever's needed. They're very reliable, and they're, um, they're great kids, and you're gonna see them go places far. Not, um, that any of our other kids will go. They're awesome. <laughs> I have great hopes for every child that comes through this building, and I really believe that, and I know my staff does as well. Thank so you. thank you. Keep up the great work. Let them introduce themselves. Huh? You guys want to? Yeah, that's a good idea. Say your name and introduce yourself. Good idea. <laughs> now they're mortified. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Mrs. Petway. She actually was the um, originator and the founder. I'm Lila Wiggins, and I'm in seventh grade. I'm Kaylin Gorman, and I'm in seventh grade as well. Um, I'm Cassandra Cruz, and I am in seventh too. All right, great. Thank you. My apologies. Sarah Lestage is our new library media specialist, and she's here as well. Great. And she actually um, read the book to every um, uh, class in the school and did, led the was the lead person on the rock project and helped us out with the painting of the the rock. So sounds like a great project, yeah. uh, Commissioner Harvey. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, great job we're doing here, and I just wanted to have you talk a little bit about um, parent engagement here at Carrington. Um, are there any parents here tonight? 
We do. We have a few parents here tonight. Raise your hand. All right, great. Now, could you talk about um, the participation in our uh, governance councils and what types of activities do we have um, at Carrington that are um, mm -hmm. assisting with welcoming, creating a welcoming environment in the school for parents? Well, um, last year we focused on um, the Boost Project, which was bringing in um, programs into um, the school for after school programs for right. the, the students. And um, this year, the Governance Council, um, we have seven parents on the Governance Council. And I have to say, um, it is a little bit challenging to have parents um, volunteer for mm -hmm. uh, the year. And, but we do have seven committed parents. And um, the focus that um, we are focusing on is having more parent engagement and having um, parent nights and setting up different times for them and an interest because um, we have done like literacy nights and it's the same core of parents that we get mm -hmm. but we'd like to expand that and we're hoping that um, if we do different events and um, we're hoping to reach more parents and get them involved and get them to network and get to meet um, their students friends and, and other parents um, we had an ice cream social last week, and it was very successful. I think it was one of the, it was over 200 uh, parents that came out, and I think it was uh, very well attended. Um, we have a new parent liaison that just started with us this year, and who actually is a parent of, in the school as well. She has uh, children that come here, and um, she's very passionate, and she has some good ideas. and. Um, so that's really our focus this year, is just trying to get more parents to, to come out. Because I think it is a great school and I would like to see more parent involvement and have activities that interest parents to come, to come out. And we have been brainstorming for that. And um, we have a student of the month actually on Monday. Mm -hmm. And our student of the month this year is focusing on um, characters, characteristic and character traits. And our first one um, for October is um, focusing on honesty. That's the character trait. So it's not just um, student of the month for academics, but it's working on that character building trait. So great. Okay, and, and one last um, thing is we're um, trying to um, grow from within um, our teachers, mm -hmm. and uh, we have Carrington on the list um, for the Young Educators uh, Society. So um, look for that. Okay. Um, because it's Carrington and a few other schools that we want to, you know, try to hone in and see uh, what we could do to gather interest in the mm -hmm. teaching profession. Yes. Um, starting at a young, young age. Mm -hmm. So um, look for that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I would Thank welcome you. Welcome that, and I would welcome any ideas that you may have to bring parents in okay. and to get them involved. So. Great. Thank that you. That would be great. Great. Any other questions? Thank you very much, and we look forward to a great year. Great. Thank you. Come on by and visit anytime you'd like. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, next are uh, a couple of policies. Uh, a, number 5150. Commissioner Sweeney. <laughs> okay. Uh, 5150 um, is a toilet training policy. Um, this was first uh, drafted and approved back in 2012. I think that was before um, we had the focus we have on early childhood um, education. Uh, we have a number of state and federal grants that do not um, allow us to um, refuse a child entrance to the programming um, simply on the basis of not being toilet trained. So the committee um, spent two sessions um, going over this and has arrived at the policy that you now see here, which simply states Waterbury Public Schools welcome entry to the early childhood program for all three and four year olds. There is an expectation that children will arrive at the program toilet trained. For children who have not completed their training, a planned approach will be developed for both school and home, collaboratively implemented by the child's family, classroom aide, and or paraprofessional. 
Um, and Jaron Schwartz, maybe can give you some background on, on what that collaboration would look like. Good evening. Good evening, Chief so, Academic Officer Darren Schwartz. Yes. So uh, thank you uh, for that, Commissioner Sweeney. Uh, again, uh, this is a uh, policy that's uh, being supported by the Office of Early Childhood, who's asked us to um, not deny children based on uh, normal developmental processes when we're receiving state funding. Um, uh, what that process would look like in terms of uh, collaboration is uh, obviously our preschool assistants and preschool teachers and preschool paraprofessionals all, all versed in developmental processes and uh, age-based growth. Um, but when it comes to toileting and toileting tra toilet training, if we do have a student that comes in, uh, the collaboration has to include the family because the family has to support the education uh, in this area. So uh, the family, the teaching assistant and or paraprofessional within the room um, will uh, come up with a plan and implement that at the school and uh, buttress that with uh, support at home, providing literature and information and uh, uh, reporting back and forth between school and home. Um, typically we see uh, from last year, we saw students come in uh, um, with a, that a few were learning how to um, be, be toilet trained and it took anywhere between two to three months to complete the training and to, and to, to finish that off. And so uh, we anticipate that to continue to happen uh, as students may come in uh, who are still learning and developing in that area. And um, if not, that would lead to other discussions. If the, the child seems to have, be having difficulty, it could lead to other discussions regarding possible developmental delays, um, um, uh, physical issues the child may be having. And, uh, and, and so we, we address those as those, those come forward. Thank you. Commissioner Theriol. <coughs> uh, to say that I received numerous phone calls over this issue is an understatement. Mm. I have been bombarded, bombarded with calls regarding this. I did take the time to go up to Drake School and to meet with one of the teachers, and I got several phone calls from other teachers who say that the effectiveness of the program is really going down because they're spending most of their time doing the toilet training of numerous kids that are in the program. Uh, we had a policy before that said didn't prefer that the kids were toilet trained and said they must be toilet trained. I can understand the motivation for this one because this change in policy, because of the change in state and federal grants and the rules and regulations. But that being said, I think we ought to also consider giving these uh, individual classes that have large amounts of these students some additional help. If we're going to say that the aides and pair professionals are now going to do the diaper changing and the toilet training, it's nice to have it collaborative with the parents and that's where it should be. <clears throat> and I can understand some of the kids uh, having difficulty and they may need uh, further assistance with the teachers and the parents and so forth. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with this, but I am hearing from the rank and file that this is working out disastrously. I heard from a teacher, a teacher of 16 years, another teacher of 36 years. Um, they need more help. They're spending an inordinate amount of time on students that need toilet training. So I think this needs to be thought out a lot better than it has been. And I think you should go to the rank and file, should go to the teachers and talk to them. I understand they may come down here next week and speak to us. So that being said, uh, I wonder if there wasn't another way to resolve this by uh, providing additional assistance to the classroom teachers for three, four, and five-year-olds. 
that have this uh, problem with toilet training. Thank you. If I may? Yes. So all of the classrooms that have three-year-olds, there isn't a single class, last count as of two weeks ago, that at any student at any time, there were, more, there were no more than three students per class. Uh, none of them are in diapers, they're in pull-ups. And every single uh, teacher that's had the three-year-olds added in does have an additional assistant in their classroom. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Stango. Thank you, President Brown. <clears throat> uh, just a few questions, uh, sure. Mr. Schwartz. Um, when, when the change has to take place, um, <clears throat> for example, the diapers, the pull-ups, the wipes, whatever, mm. where, where, where do they come from? Where, do, where does what come from? Pardon? Where does what come from? The diapers, the wipes, the, the uh, pull-ups. So if it's a uh, co-taught classroom, it, it could come from the special education budget. They do have a preschool line for that. Uh, if not, it comes from the school-based budgeting uh, process. Each school gets a certain allotment uh, per child, including preschool children. And um, if a change needs to take place, where does that change take place? So uh, there's, a, there's a few different uh, places. It matters the building and it matters the location. Sometimes in the bathroom, if there are tables set up there, um, there are changing tables that have been ordered, although um, it is not a NIAC standard that you must have a changing table uh, for students, that you could use it any hard surface, such as a cot or, or, or other areas within the classroom. It really depends uh, from school to school and class to class, uh, depending on where they deem fit. Uh, changing tables are uh, being older, ordered for all classrooms, um, even though uh, we've, it hasn't been requested and all, we just would feel more comfortable that they have that option if, uh, if, they, cho if they choose to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does the para who does the changing, does that para need written permission from the parent to be able to do this? No. Does not need written permission? So, I mean, there's, we are covered with that situation. There's not an issue that uh, someone is changing their child. An issue as in if they just change the child and put them into a clean uh, pull-up? No, there is not an issue. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how, um, Mr. Swartz, how many, peop how many kids do we have in a classroom that may require changing on average? I mean, are we talking, uh, first of all, a classroom of the three, four-year-old group, how many would be in that classroom total? Could be 18 in the morning, 18 in the afternoon would be the, the highest scenario possible. Okay, and, and what would you say the percentage of, of children that have to be uh, trained that coming into the classroom have to be, tra are not trained yet and need to be changed? Two or three at a time. Uh, it could be the high, three is is the highest total from the last count that uh, we had two weeks ago at any one time in a classroom. Eighteen so, eighteen total uh, in the in the system. Okay, so a classroom that has eighteen students in it, possibly three of those need to be tended to. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, you already answered, or I think uh, Commissioner Sweeney did. We didn't have a problem with denying access if you're not trained, but now the state is requiring that because of grants? The, the state has always required it. We did not uh, adhere to what the state uh, administered. It was brought to the state's attention through the school readiness liaison, um, through our policy. The Office of Early Childhood, Angie Brinnell, wrote a, a specific email that said denying children education based on a developmental process such as toilet training um, is against state regulation and it goes against um, uh, the grant itself, the, any state funding grants. So if, we, if this was to fail on vote, what would be the consequences of this to this district? That would be a question for the state to Department and Office of Early Childhood. Okay. Um, the parents who do the changing, that part of their job description that they are required to do that? Uh, toileting is, and hygiene is in their job description. Okay. 
But a teacher would never be required to do that. Uh, as of right now, we, we rely on the, on the paraprofessionals and the classroom assistants to do the training, the toilet, toileting. How can you say as of right now? Um, because as of, prior to this, there was some teachers uh, pitching in and doing it uh, if they felt necessary. I think that um, to say that they would never do it is a little bit of a stretch. I think that most teachers, if there was an issue, for example, um, para gets pulled from the class, something happens to the assistant, um, all of a sudden uh, a child is in need and uh, f for whatever reason uh, someone is not going to be back in the classroom for maybe several minutes. I think most teachers might step in, but as a, as a, as a, as a, as a rule of thumb, teachers are not changing and we don't expect them to change. We expect this to be the assistants and the paraprofessionals. Um, it's not, we want our teachers focused on instruction and other developmental processes, not on, not on changing pull-ups. Um, okay, I don't, I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of it much, but how, if, if there's a class of 18 children and three of them are known to be, have um, mm -hmm. not toilet trained, mm -hmm. but if they have pull-ups on mm -hmm. and, and, and if an incident takes place, how do we know the incident has taken place? Does the para can, uh, have to periodically check? Uh, I can't answer that for every child. I'm sure it's different in many different cases, but um, just having a five and seven year old at home that was, that they were potty trained when they were, when they were two, uh, usually at that stage, typically they will inform the adult in the classroom that uh, the, the, the diaper has soiled. <laughs> um, periodic checks, I, I, I don't think usually, don't, don't occur. Uh, usually children at that age are pretty good at um, um, informing the adult in the classroom. However, um, if there was a case where a child is um, hesitant to do so, I am sure that the assistants and the paraprofessionals have caught onto that trend and, 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 and may ask the child quietly outside, do you need to change? Um, um, do they go inspecting the pull-ups uh, physically? I, I would venture to say no, but I, I, I don't want to answer that not knowing every single situation. Um, I think that the children usually inform the adult. I, I was just asking that for because looking for a disruption of what's going on in the normal flow of the, cl of the class, and um, you know that's the only reason. Um, now, in the policy, it mentions that. Um, they, there'll be a planned approach with the parents and the paras. Is, is this planned approach after a period of time? Is it readdressed? Is, is, how, how do we know? What's the assessment of that planned approach, that it's working or not working? So uh, there's a few things. Uh, one, I've asked the, the interim preschool supervisor, Amy Sims, to uh, do a, a, a revig of training for all pairs and assistants. Uh, for the upcoming professional development day, uh, including uh, the, the, the approach. Um, I think each individual child, it matters where they are in the development. So uh, if you're coming in with zero, um, zero <laughs> potty training experience, uh, that approach is very different than a child who's coming in who um, is just having maybe a few accidents now and then. And so it, it, I don't want to not answer the question, but it does matter. This is a development, and it does take a few months to go through. I think that a, a weekly periodic checks with the with the home and, and, and the school communicating about the progress is the best way to go on each individual case. But um, you know, I, there's not like a one answer fits all. Each child is really in a different spectrum based on previous education and training in this area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so if I can just wondering it loud here. Sure. When the child is registered, suppose the child is registered during the summer mm -hmm. for classes to begin in September, and the child is not toilet trained at that mm -hmm. point. I think that we need to, who, who's ever doing the registering, mm -hmm. be, be strong in suggesting that you've got two months before this child starts school, really do all you can in the home 
to get this child ready for school. And I think that has to be uh, mm -hmm. really made, the parents need to really be aware of that. I've directed the Office of Early Childhood to, to not only ask the question, but also uh, to provide parents with strategies uh, to take home with them and to encourage just that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And just to wrap it up one more. Um, I'm sorry it takes so much time That's here. That's okay. <laughs> Obviously, you've put a lot of thought. A, right, and just in, in wrapping it up here, um, the, the internet tells me that 98% of kids are trained by the age of three. So 98% are trained, that means two are not trained. 2% are not trained. And the average of toilet training is, um, takes place at about 30 months. Um, and that training should begin around 25 months. So I, I think if all of that was taking place, I don't think we'd have an issue by the time school starts and the student is three, I would hope. I would have to check the primary source on that, but I'd also say that if, um, if, if the child was not getting any sort of training, then that would, that would probably throw that statistic off. I'd also say that um, three is a wide range, so I'm not sure if that means by the age of three or by the end of being three. There's a 11 month span there. All right. Thank you for your answers. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, going on. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Thierry. Anyone else yeah. want to speak? For I the first don't time? think so. I think we kind of. Okay, Commissioner Van Stone after Commissioner Thierry. Uh, just ahead? quickly, I won't. Charles asked a number of my questions, so that's fine, we won't repeat it. Um, while I'm not 100% comfortable with this, and I think, you know, sometimes we as a, a district and a government take a lot of the things that uh, parents are really supposed to be doing away from them uh, in the hopes of bettering things, you know, this troubles me a little bit. I am glad, however, through the committee process that I think we got to a better policy than I think we started with. Um, you know, I, I like that the the language is still pretty clear that there's an expectation that children come ready. Um, so while that's not we're going to lock the door and kick them out, it's probably the next step. And and I think to Charles's point that you know I, I think that needs to be delivered. That you know it's if you want your kid to succeed as best they can in the class, we need all the adults in there kind of pulling in the same direction for educational resources, not only for toileting. So I'm, I'm glad that through the committee work we were able to um, tighten up this language and, and I, I wanted to thank the committee for that work. Um, I, I think that's all I got. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Theria. Well, what we've really done here is we have negated the policy and we have created a new procedure, which we would have done anyways, a collaborative, cooperative uh, plan with the parents would be something that we would do anyway. So we're just kind of state, stating the obvious here. Uh, congratulations on your children being potty trained, Mr. Swartz. Um, I'm sure not all of our kids have the luxury that your kids have. But that being said, some of the teachers have actually contacted the Board of Health regarding a number of issues. Number one, what do you do with the soiled diapers? Number two, is there a private area that these kids can be changed? If my son had this problem, my daughter had this problem, I certainly wouldn't want their diaper or their pull-up pulled down in the middle of the classroom and then pulled up. I'd expect it to be in a private area. Even small children deserve privacy. Um, I, it's my understanding that there were no changing tables in a lot of places, and you answered that question by saying that changing tables would be ordered. I certainly hope that it would be in a room that could be locked where people, not in a regular bathroom, where people could go in and out at will. That would be another concern. The Board of he Health refuses to get involved in this thing, uh, as they do occasionally. They say it's not our
domain, it's the Board of Education's domain. Well, if you were the teacher, you might argue with that point. So I really wonder if all these things are going to be resolved. It doesn't seem to be a huge problem when you look at the numbers. It's only a huge problem when you're in the classroom and you've got three of these kids that are constantly in distress in terms of soiling their pants or uh, other problems with, uh, with going to the bathroom. Then it becomes a huge problem. I know you said that there are additional people within the classroom. That's true. There actually are two at Driggs. But I wonder as this problem continues, if we're gonna address these other situations with regard to privacy, you said something about the changing tables, um, in an area where we could go into the bathroom and we could lock the door. Uh, I'd certainly never want a child to be diaper changed or their diapers uh, removed and so forth within the classroom. I think that's way above uh, what we should be doing. So hopefully these problems will be resolved. I'm sure you're gonna hear from the WTA regarding this. And uh, I, I wonder if, uh, if I was as prepared as Charlie Stengel was, Commissioner Stengel was, if I would have been allowed to continue because so often I'm kind of cut short. But good for you doing the research, Commissioner Stengel. I'm kind of just talking from the cuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Um, the next uh, policy, uh, Commissioner Sweeney, bylaws of the board, public meeting section C, number 9010. Okay. So section C has to do with uh, the meetings of the board. Currently the policy reads, the board shall hold its regular meetings on the first and third Thursday of each month, except in July and August when meetings shall be held only on the first Thursday. The president of the board shall have the discretion to reschedule meetings, which under the above formula would otherwise fall on a holiday. In discussing both reducing the number of meetings held by the board and using our committees effectively to bring forward resolutions to the board. Um, we discussed it and we um, are recommending that they, the new language which says the board shall hold its regular meetings on the third Thursday of each month. The president of the board shall have the discretion to reschedule meetings under the above formula if conflicts arise. So we are dispensing with the second meeting in a month we can still continue and we discussed although it is not a part of the bylaws the workshop and reducing that to one workshop a month on the first thursday of the month and that that will give us some time in between to review our packets gather information ask questions and be ready to vote at a voting meeting on the third thursday of the month so that is where we're at. And that is the resolution. Commissioner Wack. I'm just wondering where's the above formula? <laughs> the board shall hold its regular meetings on the third Thursday of the month. That is the above formula. Okay, I didn't see that as a formula. I thought there was something where that's just, okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. okay, anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Theriot and Commissioner Van Stone. Yeah, I have thought long and hard about this. Uh, I will try to be brief. Um, at a time when we are preaching parent involvement, parent engagement, voter participation, representing the voter, representing our various communities throughout the city of Waterbury, looking for inclusion of parents, guardians, aunts, uncles, and so forth, this would result in all of those people only being able to address the board one time a month. 
one time. <clears throat> sure, it would make the meeting shorter, sure. If I were selfish, I'd love to have just two meetings and not, uh, I enjoy listening to the parents myself. I get something out of it, each and every one when they, when they speak, because they have a kind of an ax to grind. If I had my way, I'd keep the meetings the way they are, and not only would I let parents talk before the regular meeting, I'd let them talk before the workshop meeting too. Why not? What's wrong with that? You want to make a change? Make it more inclusive. Make it more open. Make it more welcoming. But no, we want to go to this new policy of two meetings a month and one board meeting where the parents and the public can talk. The public are the people that elect us. Is your vote tonight going to be the price of patronage? Is your vote tonight going to be because somebody told you to vote this way, you're going to vote this way? I hope not, because I hear over and over again about up, us representing the community. The community has spoken, north, south, east, and west. We have a tremendous volume of business that we have to <coughs> handle during the Board of Education year. Tonight it happens to be a little light, but most of the time it's not. I can remember times coming to meetings, and Charlie and others here can remember coming to meetings where we started at 5.30 and we didn't get out till 11. So now all of a sudden we're going to take that meeting and we're going to put it all in. We're going to put 10 pounds of work in a five pound bag. I don't see. I mean, as I said, if I were a selfish person, and I'm not, I knew what I was getting into when I got into this. I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours off of this table, off of this meeting, doing reports, keeping track of statistical data with regard to the test scores, the attendance, the population. I go to the meetings. I conscientiously go to the meetings. I type out the meetings. I don't take a little scribble and put it at the bottom of the committee meeting <clears throat> as being done and complete. Two or three sentences. I just did the report on the building and grounds. It was four pages long. I'm not doing that to pat myself on the back. I'm doing that because to be a board commissioner and to take it conscientiously requires a tremendous amount of work and effort and diligence. And now we're going to cut it down, going to cut the, uh, by cutting it down, you think you're going to cut the work effort? Now, in terms of the committee meetings, I find the committee meetings just the way they are to be extremely effective. And if we say we're going to have less meetings and we're going to make the committee meetings, subcommittee meetings more effective, I don't think that's true. I don't think those subcommittee meetings will uh, meet or the chairman of the subcommittees will meet any more than they currently do. I think this is a fallacy. I think this is a sham. And I think if it passes, I think the public ought to take a good look at those on the board that are running and say, hmm, are those people really representing my interest? So I would say, in the future, keep it the way it is and possibly expand the opportunity for the public to speak at our regular meetings and possibly even our workshop meetings. Yes. Yeah, it would take longer. Yes. But that's why you're here. You were elected. You were elected to work longer, to work harder, to let the people get up there and represent uh, the particular grievances that they have. Well, I think that's about it. I, I almost uh, lasted as long as you did. To Commissioner Stango, yes. without being interrupted. Thank you. Commissioner Van Stoll and then Vice President. Thank you, Madam President. Um, well, I think a lot of the things Commissioner Theriault says are true, I think his conclusion is completely wrong. Um, 
I believe in the idea of interaction between this board and parents and the community. And I know that at least on my two Thursdays off, that gives me the opportunity to go where the parents are. How many things are we invited to every month that we'd all love to be part of, except they all happen to be at 6 o'clock on a Thursday? And as much as I love Danielle and Maggie, who are our two continuous speakers who come and voice their opinions every time, it saddens me that we don't have more. So I believe that if the goal is better parent engagement, if the goal is meeting with the community more, if they're not coming to us, let's go to them. That's my philosophy on that. As far as longer meetings, I don't necessarily think a longer meeting is a more efficient meeting or a better meeting. I've gotten things done in meetings that last three minutes that were more effective and more productive than meetings that took 16 hours. Length does not necessitate necessarily mean things were done. And we're all human beings. When we're in hour six of a meeting, are we functioning at our best? Probably not. So if the goal for this board for point two is to be efficient and to do good things for the district, I think more smaller, shorter meetings through the committee process is better than a five-hour workshop followed by a three-hour regular meeting. We've seen it in the last few months since we last talked about this, both in the curriculum and in policy, where we've had two chairs who have actively called meetings and actively put work in at the committee level, brought it here. So we've proven to ourselves that if we care to do it, we can make the committee process work. But to do the committee process and then a workshop and then a regular meeting, what that does, it eats up time. So we get our long meetings, but we don't accomplish anything. We talk about paving roads. We talk about elevators. We talk about roofs. That's what we talk about. We don't talk about achievement enough. We don't talk about curriculum enough. We don't talk about the things I think could make this district better because we're inundated with this other stuff. We have more fruitful conversation and get things done in the committee level than we do here. And I think if you say it's not true, you're kidding yourself. So if we can continue that committee process, which I think we can, and expedite it without having a deja vu Groundhog Day here at the workshop level, which is what we had tonight. That could have freed up this last 40 minutes of talking about what we just talked about for something about maybe Carrington stats. We could have learned more about those cohorts and what those exact plans were that they did to bump those kids up 9 and 10 percent. This board can do better. And I don't believe that changing from one regular meeting in one workshop from the system we have now actually decreases anything. I believe we'll actually end up doing more work. And we will have more time to talk about stuff. And if this board wants to grant the public the, the ability to speak in committee meetings, that's fine by me. But I don't think changing this setup, the way it's written about here, does anything but potentially allow this board to be more efficient and more productive. So unless our goal is to be less efficient and less productive, I think this is the way to go. I've been a proponent of it from the beginning. Um, you know, I serve on a lot of boards, and I work in business. We are about as inefficient as it gets. And being inefficient just because that's the way it's always been is a pretty terrible reason to remain inefficient. And these are our bylaws. If a year from now, this has all gone to pot, so you know what? It was a failed experiment. Let's go back to the old way. But I think this is the right policy for this board if we are truly interested in talking about the important things in our meeting and not just the day-to-day the -day business, which ends up eating up most of our meetings. Uh, the only other thing I would add, I thought there was uh, a point to be added at the end about a general Roberts Rules of Order will govern our meetings. Was, that, was I incorrect in that? 
I don't recall it, but we can have it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think most of the committee always thought it was in it, I and it never it was. I thought it was, but it's yeah, not. I thought it was. It's not. Yeah. So even though I think we've all been operating under that, mm -hmm. if we could just add item whatever it is, I, J, <coughs> K, um, to the end, I would like to amend um, the, by -roll, the, the bylaws to, to state that Robert's Rules also runs these meetings. So we could do that next week at the meeting? Yeah. <coughs> Uh, thank Vice you, President. I'm thank sorry. you. Vice um, President and then Commissioner Hardy. Uh Thank you, um, President. Through you, uh, I think Jason uh, hit it quite eloquently, and I, I really don't want to add too much to that because I think he hit all the points that I, I was thinking as well. I, I think we spent a lot of time on number two, talking about number two, that um, it took up most of this meeting. I, I will say this. Um, you know, what we have to fear and when we talk, I think this is, initially when we, this first was brought up a while back, I wasn't in favor of it uh, because I, it frankly did look like another, a day off. However, in speaking to several commissioners and listening to their viewpoints, I, I changed my mind and then I realized, you know, it's, it's true. One of the things that I fear, and I fear for you other commissioners and even the, com the candidates that are running, is meeting burnout. I'm a chair of like three different committees. We meet every Thursday. Then they say, hey, can you meet on Monday? Can you meet on Tuesday? Can you meet on Wednesday? I'm sorry, but I work full time. I have young kids. I'm involved in other committees. I can't have meetings every day after work and not have a life. And so, um, yes, I value parents' engagement. We encourage parents to come to the board meetings, but it's true. I speak to more parents outside of board meetings than I do at board meetings. And that is where real work gets done. You may not see the work, the public may not see the emails that, or the phone calls that we make advocating or supporting the parents' concerns, but they are being done. And so I will support this change. Uh, I think Jason hit the, the nail on the head perfectly. I think we could be more efficient, more effective in this. Unfortunately, uh, my term is over November 30th, so I won't benefit from this if it does move forward. But I will say the candidates, they will benefit from it. And I think much more work, more better work will get done with this setup than it has been in the past. And don't let anything else fool you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Harvey. Thank you. Well, okay, I'm going to hit this at a different angle. As I recall, I've been on this board for 12 years. So as I recall, the first sort of business after an election are the bylaws. That's the first thing that the board votes on, approval of the bylaws. So my question is, we have gone back and forth with this, um, pursued it, dropped it, forgot about it, talked about it. My question is why now? In about three weeks, we are going to have an election, five of us, okay, as prescribed by our bylaws, where they may or may not be a change. So my question is, why are we doing this now? If I were a new member coming on the board, knowing that this is the first order of business once I was elected, my question would be, why are you not allowing me to make that decision? Why are you trying to make that decision for me? Um, if we have toyed around with this for the period of time that we have, then I think we are disrespecting those who are maybe new, reelected to the board, Every two years, five members are up for election. So I question the timing on this. Next thing I question is why Thursdays? Why not Mondays? Why not Tuesday meetings? Thursdays, as a lot of us are finding out or have found out, is that everything is held on Thursday. Okay, generally, the thought was if you change it to Thursday, meetings, Board of Ed, then you could attend the Board of Alderman, Alderman meeting or whatever meetings. But everything is held on the Thursday now. So if you're going to change something, 
why not change the night that we have it? Um, we originally started having our, we had Monday, meetings on Mondays. Why not go back to that? So why not address that? Now let's talk about the committee meetings. As I have professed, because I am a, re a recipient of it, the selection process, as outlined in our bylaws, there's an issue with it. I have an issue with it. It's not fair. Going to committee, I agree with that. We can, we can get a lot done in committee. But once we select, have the selection process done fairly, but if it's not going to be done fairly, I am not going to go along with it. That's the third reason why I'm against it. Now, we act as if we don't have anything. This board doesn't have, I mean, the, the, the agenda is very short tonight. Um, I'm informing the public that that's not true. We have a lot of issues that we have to deal with. Arrests, test scores, um, family engagement, which is the state of family engagement in Waterbury is in turmoil, turmoil right now in Waterbury. So we have a lot of issues that we need to deal with. I am for efficiently run meetings. I am for that if we promise to do that. Okay, but if we don't promise to do that, we can, we can have a, a half a meeting and we still will not accomplish anything. So I am not for this. I'm not for it, again, because why are we doing it now? I think we're shortchanging um, those who are running for the Board of Education, um, their chances to change things. It's the first order of business after the election. Secondly, why Thursdays? Why don't we change it to Monday? Why don't we change it to another night? And the committee meeting, uh, excuse me, the committee selection process, I have issue with that. And in addition, while we're on the subject of committees, our meeting minutes are horrible. And I hope that we will look at some order, other way to have more detail, some detail in our committee meetings. So I am not against it, uh, not, I am not for this at all. Uh, Commissioner Van Stone. Commissioner Sweeney. And please let's I have our had. comments to the, to the actual uh, revi revised bylaws before us. I think we're getting off this, the topic a little bit. I don't bit. think we are. Go ahead. I have been, um, I guess, the lucky recipient um, at my committee meetings of having parents attend on occasion. Thank you. Uh, other commissioners who are not on the committee attend. Karen, you call in sometimes on committees that you're not on. So I think there's ample opportunity even for people to participate <coughs> at the committee level. The decision to, do, to bring this forward as a resolution for Thursdays was the decision of the committee was not anyone on the committee who suggested Mondays or any other day. This was a suggestion of the committee. That is the function of the committee to bring forward the resolution that the committee agrees upon for board approval. It is the bylaws of the board. If anyone along the way wants to change a bylaw, all they have to simply do is request that the committee take a look at it, that it be brought before the board, and that the board vote in favor of changing the bylaw. Just as we're doing now, there's nothing felonious in the timing of this. I was asked to look at it again by a number of the committee members and by the chair. So here we are. Meeting minutes are governed by state sunshine laws and Robert's rules, which say that the minutes should contain the attendance of the committee, members in attendance, the time the meeting starts, 
what votes were taken, and what time the meeting adjourns. That's the requirement for minutes. So I'm in support of this. I think that committee meetings will be more effective. I think workshops will be more effective. I think regular meetings will be more effective because we will increase the focus and we will hear the voice that we have heard from board members and from the public to focus on those things that address student achievement in this district. That's where our focus needs to be for too long. There are too many other things outside that focus. We need to get not just more efficient, but more focused on what our role is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Commissioner Theriot. Well, first of all, uh, Robert's Rules of Order kind of permeates all of our meetings, whether they're committee meetings or otherwise. As a matter of fact, when we go to our regular meetings, the president is not supposed to talk to any of the topics. Occasionally she does, and we let her get away with it, but technically, when we look at Robert's Rules of Order, she should recuse herself turn the meeting over to the vice president and then talk on that topic and all the time that topic is discussed the vice president would be in charge of the meeting so uh, I know people look at me as being a little cantankerous once in a while and wanting to kind of put a choke collar on me I don't blame them but that that's still I still will operate and always have within the parameters of Robert's rules. Uh, I'm glad to see that democracy is alive and well at this meeting. I'm glad to see that people have a divergent opinion and have an opinion one way or another. I think that's great. I agree with Commissioner Harvey. The way she was slammed and cut off from her committees and cut off from every single chairmanship of the committee I think was a disaster. For whatever reason it took place, it did happen. And I think she's absolutely right that in the future, when we reelect our new committees, that they should be done equitably and fairly on the basis of somewhat of seniority. So you, Commissioner Harvey, have my 100% support with regard to that. Thank you. And we all know the pathology of what happened there and why it happened without delineating it. And we also know the reason why we changed our meetings from Monday to Thursday. It wasn't the committee that did that. It was the committee members and the chairman of the committee that were told the administration wanted to attend the Board of Aldermen meetings as well as the Board of Education meetings, and they were both on Monday night. And how often do we see the administration at a Thursday meeting? Hardly ever. And I'm not saying the administration or implying the administration is not doing a good job. That's not the point. The point is we changed our meetings from Monday to Thursday. By having two meetings as opposed to four, that will make us more effective. Okay. I heard the other speakers speak. I agree with their right to disagree, and I agree with their analysis of the situation from their standpoint, but I don't agree. I still maintain that we should have four meetings the way we have, and those meetings we should extend to the uh, workshop meetings so that the public can speak. I would agree that most of the committee meetings, the minutes are deplorable with the exception of my committee where the minutes are impeccable not slapping myself on my back again but somebody's got to say it if you want to see the way the minutes should be done at a committee meeting check my check my committee and you'll see I even include Karen Harvey attends the meeting by phone I even include her comments over the phone thank you so there should be some sort of a format in terms of what's said instead of having 
three or four words at the bottom of the page. So democracy is alive and well. Uh, I talked, I spoke about uh, the selection process. Maybe it might be a good idea if the people that are interested in various committees put their names in and the person that has the most seniority be at least considered. But whatever you do, I'm not going to vote. I'll never, I never vote to shorten the meetings. I know the other people and they had good rationales for their thought. I'm not faulting that. Very good rationales for the thought. And maybe they're right. But I thought I had pretty good rationale for my thought too. So as we go forward, let your conscience be your guide. And uh, think of the public in general. And know, and know that the public will only be allowed to speak one time a month under this new, I want to call it a gerrymandered process because someone gave the elbow to somebody, somebody else gave the elbow to somebody, and all of a sudden we have a policy meeting just before the election. And I also agree with Commissioner Harvey on that. What's the big rush? What's the big rush here? Why can't we wait till after the election and let the new board members decide, have their conscience in terms of, you know, having their, uh, you know, having some skin in the game, so to speak. Uh, they're out there working hard. We know what it's like, the five of us that aren't running. We know what it's like to pound the pavement. We know what it's like to go to the meetings and various things. We know. And uh, there are germane points that uh, the other speakers that spoke against uh, for this, and I'm against it, have made. And I say kudos to them. Democracy is alive and well. Thank you. Commissioner Harvey. Thank you. Could we, this is non-consent. We put this on, it leave this off of the consent, uh, the consent okay, calendar. For next meeting. For next meeting, It please. is non-consent. It That's is a I'm change in bylaws and it has to be heard two times. This is your first term time hearing it tonight. Okay, and, but I'm just saying, I, I understand the explanation. Yeah. I don't need the explanation. Yeah. I'm just asking that it be non-consent. Yeah, Thank it you. is non-consent by Robert's rules. Well, again, that's what I'm asking for. I don't need the explanation. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, I have a question about that. Sure. This is not a meeting. Does it have to be two consecutive meetings no, it or just two? Has to be heard by the whole board. Twice. Twice. Yep. Because if you check Robert's rules, it's two meetings. This isn't a meeting. Two hearings. Okay. Yep. And we've determined we're not run by Robert's rules. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. No, but we said we are. It's not in the bylaws. It's not in the bylaws currently. I want to add it in. Sorry. We can we can clarify that, and if it's two official voting meetings, That's then we would have to bring it up at the next right. meeting. No, I'm right. And then yeah. the next. I, I right. do. Right. You, Point of order. But you Point of order, uh, yeah. Madam Chair. <laughs> then, if it's two actual meetings, it would have to be held after the election. After the election. Bingo. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, I do. I did pull the rules, Robert's rules for bylaws, be more than happy to get them to you, but it does say two hearings. Okay. Uh, All right, we'll clarify that because yeah, we want to make sure we're, you know, we're doing, uh, following the protocols. Okay. And um, I, I did supply those to the board, we'll to the you. committee. Okay. So we'll get that information to everybody. Uh, committee on School Facilities and Grounds. Any questions? Uh, committee on school. Um, I'll just give you. Commissioner Theory. Uh, just give you a, a brief report. My report will go to the clerk of the board. And by the way, um, these are my meeting <laughs> notes. One, two, three, four. And the only point I want to make here is. At our meeting, we had a f thorough discussion of uh, profit and nonprofit organizations, the fee schedule, uh, the, the various types of projects that we're currently working on, as well as the summer projects. I'll give that to the clerk of the board. She'll pass it out to you either by hard copy and email. And I want to congratulate and thank all the members of the committee, including Commissioner Harvey, that relentlessly follows all those committee meetings. Uh, via telephone 
and uh, we had a very, very productive meeting. And kudos to Mr. Brinker and Mr. Sullivan, our new uh, school uh, inspector, who has done an absolutely phenomenal job in keeping track of our schools. And the condition of our schools is uh, tremendously, tremendously improved. We have had 40 years of absolute neglect in our schools that have been rectified in a, in, in a few short years, thanks to Mr. Cross, uh, thanks to Mr. Sullivan, mm -hmm. thanks to Mr. D'Augustino, and thank you to the mayor also for putting some muscle behind it. Uh, you look at our schools now, and uh, you know this is a brand new school, so we don't expect too many maintenance issues here. But some of the other schools, like uh, you know Washington and Hopeville and so forth, those schools constantly have issues. And kudos to you, Mr. Brinker, and kudos to you and the president of the board for saving us four and a half million dollars on the roofing project at Westside Middle School. Thank you very much. Yes. Commissioner Van Stone. Thank you, Mayor President. This is, we're still on facility? Yes. Okay. Once again, uh, requesting waivers. I don't know, you know, I know that we're taking some of this out of our hands to some degree, but um, again, requesting waivers, if they're not a nonprofit, even though we don't say a nonprofit, do we learn anything of what the event is before we say yes or no to, an, uh, to giving away our properties? There's three requesting waivers this week. One is uh, a friend to this board, very well-known group, and obviously I have no uh, problem with that. In fact, one of those is the Thanksgiving community dinner, which each year Commissioner Hernandez and I work at, volunteer at. Um, but the two other organizations, I. I I don't know what these activities are. Uh, one says Educator Training Community Forum. What is that? And we're going to waive almost $1,000. Another says Ability Beyond Arts and Recreation Program, $1,300. What is it? So do we just not care? And because they checked the box that said request <coughs> waiver, regardless of what these forums may be and what the uh, agenda is or the uh, forum syllabus, we just let it go? I mean, who's asking these questions? Because on the form, even as I scroll down to the form, you get nothing. You get nothing. And I'm not going to give up on this part about giving away our facilities for free. It, I mean, it's just, I, I, don't, I don't get it. We can't afford it. I mean, not only can't we afford it, when we pay our janitors or any other facility personnel to be there on a weekend, time and a half, double time, whatever it is, we're paying them, then when we do charge somebody, the money doesn't even come into our bank account. It goes to the city, not to us. So we're paying the overtime, and we don't get the money. You know, And then when the schools are damaged, which I don't want to hear that they're not, we pay to fix them. So what are these groups using our facilities for? And we need to know. I have no idea what these two groups are doing. I think Mr. Branker, could you shed some light for us or? I can provide an answer. I don't know if it's gonna shed much light, Madam President, but okay. thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, you're correct. The form that we use doesn't provide more information than you've seen, at least since I've been here. We did discuss it at our committee meeting, along with the change in the fees, along with uh, biannual approval of people who want to use the facility, so one group doesn't take it for the whole year, take the whole school for the whole year. But those are things that we haven't changed yet, that we're in the process. We've, we're redeveloping the form. I've met with uh, Ms. McCaslin twice on it to come up with a form that we can get to you to get out to the committee, Commissioner Theriault, and then We'll address all those other issues. I agree. We should know more about it. Well, we don't. I, and I'm going to I'm going to be straightforward here, and I'm probably going to get myself in trouble. I guess I'm used to getting in trouble. One of these groups, I've been to their events, I've seen their social media, and quite honestly, a lot of their stuff offends me. You know, I've actually deleted them from my version of social media. 
because of some of the rhetoric that they put out. But we're going to go give them a building for free? Well, they've requested it. It's come up under the current process. You can always say no. Well, can we? I mean, own. when I've tried yes. to take, I've tried in the past to take a single group off of this and was told I can't do it. That. Well, okay, then I will, I will see you after the meeting and let you know which one I want to take off. Thank you, because I have been told in the past I can't do it. So, thank you. Commissioner Theria. Uh, Commissioner Van Stone is correct. At the meeting, we did discuss uh, with Mr. Brinker uh, about taking the process from ground zero mm -hmm. and coming up with a new form and reviewing all of the profit and nonprofits, especially the nonprofits, looking at those as grandfathered in and making sure they're still nonprofits. Okay. Uh, I also th think there's another um, fly in the ointment or wrinkle on the sheets with regard to the use of our buildings by various political organizations. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we strictly adhere to that because we can't even have any political organizations go in there and use our copy machine for it to copy one single piece of paper or mail anything or do anything else politically. So I hope that the people that are using or requesting our buildings have been properly vetted so that we adhere strictly to the political process of using our buildings for political purposes. So I won't go into detail there, but I did request that of the clerk of the board, and I know there is a state law with regard to the use of school facilities and grounds with regard for political purposes, and we'll get a copy of that and maybe examine it. I can answer your question, Commissioner. I checked with the Corporation Council today. It was not a request from the office of the mayor. It was a request from the Waterbury Observer. It was just facilitated through that office. And yes, we are able to provide our facilities for a debate of that type that's listed. Okay, then that's fine. Then change the name of the person that's making the request. I will. It, we, that's all. It, that's it was, all. I, you know, I, I don't have any problem with it. I know that they need a debate. I need the good need. But you know, if, right. if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. I have the name. So changed. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to get any uh, muddy the water, so to speak, here. So that, you know, and it's supposed to be a 15 day, and it wasn't a 15 day, it was only a 10 day. So, you know, we need some clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You're thank welcome. you, Mr. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, superintendent's notification to the board. And we do have a. Madam Ma President, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry to go back to that, but it, you were reminded me when you said that. All right, I think you did, uh, Commissioner Thurio. That, the event in that. I think you're speaking of. It actually will happen before our next meeting. Yes, it will. So, okay. Next Monday. So if next I had, Monday, if exact. I wanted to pull that one, I requested that it be pulled already. Monday. So are you telling us we need consensus tonight? If uh, if if the event is being held before our next weekend, yes. It's Tuesday, if to. I'm not mistaken. It's Monday. Monday. Monday the 30th. Right. Has the has the person or the group changed the name of, of the of the initiator? I will. Uh, can we say the name? Sure. I think you have to. You have okay. To I think so too. I, I don't know why we weren't saying it before. Yeah, Joe Geary had a request from the observer, mm -hmm. uh, whose name I forget. John Murray. John Murray. Thank you very much. And he asked if he could set this in motion, and Joe checked with the business office of facilities and it was open that night and that's how they arranged it. Uh, can I change the name? Yes. I'll absolutely change the name tomorrow and send out a new form to each of you so you'll have it with the correct name. It wasn't at his request. He was just, uh, sometimes he gets a call and does things like that. It's including so it's a request all the parties. So Mr. Murray. <coughs> it is. Okay. All right. So we'll... That's certainly more bipartisan. 
it actually, from what I talked to John him today, it's uh, tripartisan, and in one case, quattropartisan. <laughs> through, through the chair. Uh, yes, Chuck. Can, can we make sure, whoever is doing this, make sure that all the affected parties are properly notified? Sure. You know, there are three parties, possibly four individuals, and I, I'd certainly like to see all the candidates get an equal opportunity and proper notice. I, I'll make sure that happens. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think me. we have to be careful. I don't, right. I mean, me. my, we can't my, notice. That would be incumbent on the We okay the building. The we building. don't do anything yeah. else. Yeah. Right. Well, well, we're exactly. we, we did right. okay the setup of the building so that there will right. be three microphones or four microphones. Whether people attend or not isn't my responsibility. But, but it's not the responsibility of us to decide whether or not the person initiating the use of the building, we tell him who to invite, right? Mr. Murray can make his own. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, just point of order. Yep. Uh, my, my point was not to have Mr. Brinker notify the people. My point was to get to Mr. Murray, who's sponsoring the event, to notify the people. So that's, not that's, the board doesn't really have anything to do with it. I know that. I, I just don't think it's Mr. Brinker's or any school staff's, uh, you know, our role to tell people who they should invite to their meeting. We're just authorizing the use of the building. So that's my thought, but yeah, Good point. you can check. Good point. Okay, we do have an executive session. Yes. Right. So we're not going to vote on it, though. I guess it was. I think uh, the underlying no, point. We're <laughs> do I have a consensus with the change with with the changes uh, mentioned to move forward with uh, the use of the building? Yes. Yes. All those uh, in favor? I, I'm just Aye. objecting. I'm objecting to point of order. Objecting to a consensus at a workshop meeting. It's equivalent to the vote, and it's out of order. We've actually done. Oh, oh, okay. still you can order. you can object. Okay. Still out. All right, executive session. Through that door. Motion to Thank convene you. an executive session Second. for discussion concerning the appointment 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 employment performance evaluation health or dismissal of a public officer or employee. Second. Second.